So, um, today I'll start to describe a thesis with the title The Type of Perceptual Decision Making of Coherent Motion Direction. Um, the layout of my presentation will be the following. Uh, I will start with the introduction where I will be explaining the title and the, with explaining the title I hope I will be leading you towards the reason of this presentation and the methods that I will be using in my experiment. Um, tactile perceptual decision making of coherent motion direction. The, the title could be more understood if it's split into two parts, tactile perceptual decision making and the other part is coherent motion direction. Tactile perception decision making is what we are want, what we are looking for to study. This is our target to study. And the second part represents what is the method we are using to study this uh, this topic. I will start my introduction by talking about decision making. Then I will be talking about perception decision making, and then how this perception decision making is studied in touch. Okay. So, decision making, our brains are continuously in a state of making hypotheses about the world, about the stimuli outside, and we're continuously validating these, um, these hypotheses with every bit of information that's entering the system. And for this, we always need to decide. This, this evidence makes our commitment about certain stimulus that it is A or B. Uh, decision making in general can be divided into cognitive decision making and perceptual decision making. Today I'm going to focus on perceptual decision making, the second one, and this is our main topic in this um, in this presentation. What's perceptual decision making? Um, you can think about perceptual decision making that in one day you are going in a foggy day, you have. The world around you is full of noise, the fog can be um, considered as noise, and you have difficulty figuring out about the identity of people around you and who are these people. With the fog being fading away, or when you get more clarity through time, now you see squeezing, you are squeezing, right, trying to find out who is there, and with more noise fading away, with more evidence coming to see, then you, you can get more evidence about your stimulus and then your perceptual decision making becomes easier. Very, very nice. Um, mm -hmm. Perceptual decision making is usually studied by changing this signal and noise ratio. You make the noise much or more, and you make the signal less, and you change it parametrically, then you can understand more how the system works. Um, usually, in, in, in vision, perceptual decision making is, is much studied since the 30s, since the 80s, like more than 30 years, and there is a very famous paradigm that is continuously used in different kinds, of, in different directions of the field, whether it's um, um, psychophysics or neuroimaging or uh, neurophysiology. Um, this paradigm is, is called the random dot paradigm. So, uh, this, this experiment, we have a bunch of dots in the middle of the field that are randomly moving around, and then you have other dots that are systemic, systematically, coherently, with each other, moving to one direction. And the subject, in, in this case, is a monkey here, is fixing, is fixating here, and then the, the task of the subject is to indicate where the coherent dots are going. So whether, here in this case, you have to say either to the right or to the left. So you have noise and you have signal, and the signal is moving to one direction, and you try to figure out which direction the noise is going. Um, this, um, this paradigm has been useful, and these are the results from the psychophysics. And you see that here is the percentage correct, what's the performance of the subject, and it's increasing with increasing the coherence. So this is the motion strength, the amount of signal dots that are moving together in relation is increasing with the increase of coherent coherence in, in, the, um, in, in the display. On the reaction time, on, uh, how fast the people are when they see these dots, also they become faster, they detect this motion faster when they are more. So, 
this is a very successful um, paradigm in decision making and also in, in, in new physiology, in measuring brain activity in, in areas that we think they are doing decision making, that we see is increase in the spike with the increase of coherency. Okay? So this has been studied for years, for, for 30 years and vision is really successful, but not done in, the, in touch in studying somatosensory um, decision making. So we thought, why not try to implement it in, in the tactile field? So my experiment, after all this introduction, is trying to move this paradigm from vision to, to, um, to touch. We were more motivated by the similarities of representation of orientation and, and motion direction between vision and touch. So there are a couple of studies that, um, that talk about where things are represented in the brain when we talk about tactile, um, tactile direction and um, it's also interesting to see the area the uh, human MT uh, area is also activated by tactile um, direction and also visual motion influences tactile perceptual uh, decision so we wanted to first try to move this paradigm and know if this is a valid paradigm to study perceptual decision making in touch and this will help us because then we can combine both. We can combine vision and touch in one experiment. We have the same stimulus, for example, that you can see and feel. And then we can then see where things are being integrated in the brain. And this is multimodal perceptual decision making, we hope. So we used, um, we used a device that has 2 by 5 10 pins. And these pins are, um, you can elevate them and retract them by this is how the device works and by elevating and retracting pins we are simulating an apparent motion that I will show you uh, right now so this is now I'm trying to move the signal and the noise box to this, this device and this is how I, I, I implemented this so this is a signal box that's moving of course it doesn't come alone but this is how I, I explain the signal box and this is how I explain a noise box <coughs> it's moving without particular direction and Super cool, eh? um, by changing the number of dots that are signal dots and, and noise dots we can reach coherence levels that are similar to the one in vision so we had, I had four coherence levels um, one, the first coherence level, one signal dot and three noise dots and two signal, two noise, three signal and one noise and then finally one coherence level with only signal dots and then the direction of movement was always either proximal to the subject, because the subject used the uh, index finger, and the direction was, so we used the unit for the index finger, and the direction was either proximal to the subject or distant from the subject. Um, this is an example trial that has the coherence level of four, so currently we see four, um, four dots that are moving together, so this is the fourth coherence level. And then I have another example for coherence level of one. So now you will see one that's difficult because this is the most difficult task. But the first dot is the one that is moving coherently. Okay? Um, we had ten participants, five males and five females. For each participant, we had ten blocks of, of trials. And each block had um, 40, five, uh, 40 trials. And these trials, the 40 trials, represented all the conditions that I had in the experiment. Um, this is a single trial of these 40 trials. It started with 200 milliseconds of black screen and then cross that indicates that the trial is coming. And then there was the uh, stimulus presented in the first uh, one second, in the first thousand milliseconds. It was presented always to the right index finger, while the subject used the keyboard, the arrows on the keyboard, to indicate whether the direction was proximal or distant. We had 400 data points from each subject. We discarded trials that the subject didn't give responses. And so we had 100 data points per <laughs> This is our results. This is my, I'm very proud of these results. So we have, for each coherence level, you can see the, this is the accuracy, how, how good subjects were, how good subjects were in their performance. And um, you can see that it's, growing with time and it's significant. <laughs> so, 
So, um, this was nice because um, coherence, uh, performance increased with coherence. So, people were better when coherence, when, when more signal introduced into the stimulus. However, on the reaction time, it was not that significant. <laughs> but, it was not that significant. Okay. <laughs> and then, subjects reported that proximal motion, proximal motion direction was a bit difficult to figure out. So we, we thought we could study the interaction between um, between proximal between the direction of motion that the proximal predicted and the coherence limit. So we ran into a factorial or two-way factorial ANOVA and we, we got the main effect of coherence level also significant. And I mean the the main effect of motion direction you can see here a bit that's there is something, but it's not significant, so there's nothing in statistics. And no interaction found between the two, uh, the two factors. Uh, we ran the same also on reaction time, and we find nothing significant. So, and I will talk about this also, why reaction time might have been like this. So, um, we, we concluded from this that the performance increase with increase with increased occurrence, a trend of better performance, maybe, of distant motion than proximal motion, and reaction time did not um, change significantly in any of my conditions. Um, what can be improved? Uh, the design of the experiment didn't allow us to get really good reaction times because the, the stimulus was presented for one second, and although the subjects were instru instructed to respond as fast as they can guess or detect the direction of motion, they always waited. This is what people did. They always waited till the uh, stimulus concluded or finished, and then they provided the, the, the response shortly afterwards. And we thought we can improve this in the future by probably making the, the stimulus go on till the subject gives a response, and then he doesn't expect like starting line for the response, or um, probably make it very short that you can't like. It's faster than the waiting process, though as soon as they get it, they try to, to, to respond. Um, we think that this paradigm now can be taken further and we can study maybe with neurophysiology, with imaging. It would be interesting to see, um, to see this, the results in MEG because it allows high temporal resolution so that you can see how things develop over time. Um, that's it, my conclusions for the day that um, Random dot motion and coherence motion seems to be a valid uh, paradigm to, to be used in touch. And what I concluded also with my results, my most important result is performance increases as um, coherence increases. Let's see. Right, yeah. It would be also interesting to try. Mm -hmm. Then, to, if the performance.
performance changes, then it can be we can understand that it's not subjective, mm -hmm. but objective representation of direction, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, for me, it's, that's the start. Then yes. we can expand in, in many directions. Yeah, the need is to reach your motion detection. What is easier? Right. Then we can move everything back, like from vision to, to try to you know, touch. Yeah, do you think that there's a way of uh, finding your tactile experiment with a visual experiment, uh, such as in the previous uh, or the standard version of the video? Do you think that would be a better approach? So, if you have, uh, so to combine your own tactile. to design and, and a follow-up experiment, which would be the next one you would do? Yeah. I would do yes. the infinite stimulus. Mm -hmm. you know, like it just goes and then they will be worried. You know, it has to. And then after a couple of trials, they will learn that they don't wait. Mm -hmm. So they will just get it. I, mean, I don't know then how it will be longer reaction times or shorter reaction times, but I think they will it will reflect the decision-making process because they will try to collect evidence and as soon as they reach the will stop. And how would you study if you wanted to find out whether vision and touch have anything in common in, in response accumulation? Uh, I would do your result. And what would you do? I would, I would measure LIP. I would mm -hmm. stick neurons there and then see the accumulation, you tell the, the, the response time in, in different conditions, once with just touch and once with just vision. Mm -hmm. um, if you did not find anything at LIP, what would you conclude? Uh, I would conclude <coughs> that maybe the LIP is just for vision and it's not.
not a master area for integrating stimuli from any modality. And I will try to look everywhere else. So I will do brain imaging to, to see where, where each modality might be presented and whether there is a master decision making area in the brain. And then after I find that, I will go there and try to see it. Thank you. 